What's up, y'all? This is Chitty Bang, and I'm on the Renegade Millionaire Show, the podcast that profiles entrepreneurs, founders, and CEOs. Join us as we go one-on-one inside the hearts and minds of some of our generation's best and brightest. And now, introducing your host, my friend, Sun Group Wealth Partners Managing Director, CNBC and Forbes.com contributor, Winnie Sun. Hi there, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in to the Renegade Millionaire Show. Once again, I'm your host, Winnie Sun, welcoming you. We are broadcasting from beautiful TuneIn Studios here in Venice Beach. As you know, I'm a financial advisor, managing partner of Sun Group Wealth Partners here in Southern California. So take a moment to follow me, and I'll update you on all sorts of Forbes, CNBC, all that fun stuff that I do. But... Without further ado, I am so excited to introduce you to Justin Blatt, who's on the line with us. Justin, welcome. Thank you for having me. How's it going? Good, good. Hey, I know you are, you know, tomorrow you'll be jet setting over to Tokyo. So thanks for making the time. Oh, of course. Yeah, we're, we're super pumped to head over there, but... Had to do this. You guys are great. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. So, you know, you are really just a mu- musical sensation. Born here in, in January 9th, 1991. And so, you know, I read your bio, and it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating one. So you were born in New York City, or in New York, I should say. And Yeah, yeah. I was, I was born in New York, mm-hmm. and uh, we moved to Las Vegas around the time I was 13 years old. Wow. And then you come from an artistic family. So the whole family does music. Um, yeah, I mean, every, every, a lot of people in my family were in, were in entertainment of some, of some kind. So my, my grandfather um, was an engineer for Jimi Hendrix. My dad um, ra- ran a party wow. planning company. My mom was a choreographer and a dancer on Broadway. So it, it's definitely in our blood. That's for sure. Yeah, and it's, what's interesting is, I mean, we know you as this huge DJ sensation, but you are actually professionally trained in, in the more traditional arts, like piano, guitar, and singing. So Yeah, no, I, it, all, it all started with, with, with real instruments for me. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, which, which is refreshing, right? Because I think from what I've, I've studied, a lot of DJs, that's not actually always the case. You actually had a very... Um, classical musical background did you find that to be helpful in what you do today oh 100 percent. i think i think my classical background and, and just my background in real instrumentation and even even my vocal training it all it all contributes to making more musical dance music a lot of the time dance music is very clubby more technical and i think one of the things that has separated me and the music that I make is just is, is my background, you know, with, with years and years of playing piano and composing and, and all that good stuff. And then I, I read in the bio, so you are almost going to um, go into the direction of my world, which was finance. And I thought, oh, you'd make such a much better decision <laughs> in, in what you've decided <laughs> to do. Well, so... How did your parents, I mean, for, for a lot of parents, for a lot of kids that we, or young people that we talk to, I mean, to have your child say, you know, dad and mom, I think I'm going to do this music thing instead of finance. How do they, how do they react to that? Yeah, it was, it was pretty crazy. I think, you know, my, my entire family had thought I would stay in the financial field my whole life. Um, I, in, in many ways, I, I still, I still am, but that's a separate conversation. I think my parents were just very, at first, surprised that, that my career in music was even something, you know, they didn't, you know, they, I guess no one really assumed it would ever exist. And it kind of just happened from things blowing up on the internet. Mm-hmm. And when the time came to make, make a decision between, you know, pursuing a career in finance, which is something that I've been working toward my whole life or pursuing a career in music, which was a relatively new um, passion and, and path and for me. It, it, was, it was definitely hard for them to accept my decision. But eventually, some professors at my, at my university, at Washington University in St. Louis, were, were actually able to convince them to let me do it. So it was, uh, <laughs> I was very lucky. How interesting. So your, your professors actually encouraged them to let you do it. 
yes, one of my my microeconomics professor in particular wow. um, that sat my parents down and, and helped help me convince them that I had to at least take a shot at it. Yeah. So. Well, that's really, that's actually very visionary of them because, you know, they are from the traditional university space. And so to you kind of mentioned, you kind of tease a little bit that you sort of kind of still are in finance. So you probably, I'm guessing, you still manage your own financial affairs then for yourself. Yeah. So so, so my father has always been uh, a money manager and an asset manager. And so he and I together, you know, work work with my personal finances. But beyond that, running running a career in music is, is a very business-oriented thing Mm -hmm. um way more than i think many people understand at least at least from from what i do personally you know a lot of artists make music and they have teams of managers and people that take care of everything in their careers Mm -hmm. i'm a little bit more hands-on um in fact a lot of people who are successful in in the dance music space i would say are pretty hands-on and that's you know hands-on with budgeting for for marketing budgets music video budgets hands-on with figuring out where to invest money in advertising, where to invest money in, in certain branding strategies. And it's, it's not financed by the book, but it's definitely business oriented. So I definitely feel like everything I learned in college didn't go to waste. That's for sure. That's wonderful. And, and, you know, we're doing this study called the millennial study. And that seems to be something we found very prevalent with the millennial generation in that, you know, unlike previous artists, a lot of people have everything managed for them, but you are very hands-on, like you said, and you said you were prevalent in your space, but to be able to do everything on your own and call the shots, it just seems so natural for what you do, right? Because you, I mean, even from the time that you started in this industry, because you said, or I, I read here, that at the age of 20, you vacationed in Sweden, and you felt like you could do a better job. Yeah, I, I mean, I think going so so going to Sweden definitely was pretty life changing for me, um, in the sense that I had never heard or listened to dance music before. And when I came back to the US I was just kind of blown away by by the lack of knowledge of a lot of my peers of, mm-hmm. of dance music. And it just so happened that I hit this wave where the that style of music started to get popular as I started to DJ and put stuff up on the internet. And so it was kind of a perfect storm for success. And I'm very lucky that that happened, that's for sure. Yeah. So can we talk about how this all started then? Because you, you talked about how this started on the Internet. So, so maybe you could tell the story of how it started for you from your perspective. Yeah. So, um, so I came back from Sweden, and I wanted to start trying to DJ. And I bought a lot of equipment hmm. with all my saved money from from teaching guitar in high school and I <laughs> started just messing with it and figuring it out. Um, eventually I was good enough to start playing like college events and they'd, I'd get paid a hundred to 200 bucks an event. Um, just wow. to, um, just to play like a sorority formal or a fraternity formal. Um, and that's how it kind of all started. Um, over time I started releasing mixes on the internet and some college blogs picked it up and all of a sudden kids at other schools, um, started listening to the stuff that I was making, which was really surprising. You know, I would never think that, that kids from another school could even, could even guess to listen to, I couldn't have ever guessed that, that it would have been popular in other places. And so I started playing shows at other colleges as well. And all of a sudden, I started making money, and <laughs> then I had to really think about I had to really think about where where I was spending my time, whether I was spending my time studying or I was spending my time you know working on improving my performances and that was a really interesting situation to be in mm-hmm. as a twenty I was twenty at the time, not even twenty one yet wow. I was twenty when that um, when that first happened wow so. and what was your what was your medium to share did you use YouTube? Um, it, some of the stuff did get big on YouTube, but it was a lot of SoundCloud as well. Um, and other, like, m- mostly SoundCloud on YouTube. Yeah, I would say that, that that's pretty accurate. Okay. Okay, great. Wow. And it happened so soon because 2011 wasn't that long ago. So you now, now kind of talk about how it just, you just kind of exploded from, from where you are now that you're describing when you're getting paid $100 and $200 event to where you are today. How did it all happen in your mind? 
how did that happen? Oh God, that's big. <laughs> um, I think, you know, I think the number one thing I would say is over the course of the past four years, and I, I've, been, I've been doing this a little bit longer than some of the other American kids who've gotten big recently. Um, over the past four or five years, the reason why I'd say everything is still great in my career is because I've learned to adapt. I think, you know, people's tastes are constantly changing. Mm -hmm. The, the industry is constantly changing. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I've learned is you can't stay stuck in one style. You can't stay stuck in one way of thinking about things because, you know, no one would have ever thought Spotify would take over the world of music as, as it currently is. Right. And I think, just being able to adapt and, and being quick on my feet, you know, th- those two things have been instrumental in, in keeping my career moving forward in, 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 in my growth as, as both a musician and, and a businessman. So That's amazing. So who are your, I guess, what, who would you consider your musical influences or inspiration? It's interesting. You know, I, I really pull influence from so many different places. Um, I, I grew up listening to Radiohead and a lot of rock music, a lot of ambient electronic music, like Aphex Twin. Um, and I kind of pull most of my influences from non-dance music places, um, or at least non-traditional, quote-unquote, EDM. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think that's, that's what makes my style a little bit unique. I think, I think fans never really know what to expect when I release a new song because everything's always been kind of different Mm -hmm. because I'm pulling influences from so many different places. Right. So That's what I was going to ask you. So what do you think takes to compose a great track? Sorry, you said what does it take to compose? Like a great track, in your opinion. Oh, a great track. Oh, a great Mm -hmm. track. I thought you said a new track. Sorry. (laughs) Um, What does it take to compose a great track? I think think it takes a lot of things... Um, there, there's, I would say, I'd say there's like three main elements of, of how I approach making music. One, you know, what, what's the science that you're using to create the music? What I mean by that is what sounds are you using? What synthesizers are you using? How, how do all the sounds fit together in the track? Which is tradition, you know, traditionally known as the mix of the track. But I think it's really important because some songs, you know, can be written on a piano, but they could be translated in lots of different ways before they actually reach the ears of the of the consumer of the music. And so it's all about picking the right sounds. That's the that's the first thing. The second thing I think that really makes a great track is, is obviously the songwriting. You know, right. is the vocal relatable? Does it present an emotional idea in a new way? Mm-hmm. Um, or you know, is is the music? You know, obviously nothing is truly original. Everything has to come from somewhere. Is the music original enough? Hmm. compared to things that have come before it. That's the second thing I would say. And then the third thing I would say is, you know, kind of similar to the second thing, what's the overall emotion of the song? And how does how does someone listening to the song react when they first hear it? Right. Do they react on the first listen? Do they react on the fifth listen? You know, when, when do they reach that aha moment? Oh my God, this is a great song. And I think that those are all the things I think about when I make music. Watch, wow, Justin, that's incredible. I mean, it's, you basically broke it down so eloquently, almost like you were teaching a class on this. So let me ask you this. Did you kind of figure this out <laughs> yourself, or did you did you have people teach you this process? I think, you know, it's interesting. I think it's, I think it's just something that I've learned. I don't think it's really something that can be taught. Um, it's hmm. like, you know, it's almost like when you're doing a, a, a present value calculation in finance, you know, by the... By the two hundredth time, you know how to how to set it up. That's right. right. That's right. I think I think that's kind of where I am in music. It's 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 uh, it's just something that I've learned from trial and error of releasing my own music, from evaluating other people's music, from seeing on the internet. You know, thank God for mm-hmm. being able to see how popular certain things are just by the click of a button, right? So mm-hmm. I could I could hear a song and I could be like, oh my god, I love this. I wonder how popular it is, <laughs> and then I can go online and see. Oh the wow! Analytics. I was right, like this song is popular. Yeah, and I really like playing that guessing game. You know, like where I, when I hear something new for the first time, I'm like, I wonder if this is a big song on the internet, and then I'll go and I'll be like, yes, I was right. You know, wow. just from being able to hear and how how people react in my own head, and I think that yeah, so it's, it's definitely a learned skill. It's something that you know can't necessarily be taught as much as just being able to understand people's tastes and understand your own taste in relation to a more mainstream taste. And that's, that's kind of, I think, the biggest thing in being an artist these days. 
Yeah, you know, that's a good point because, you know, I interviewed Randy Jackson not too long ago and he said the same thing. He says, you know, there's something, there's what you love, but there's also what also pays the bills, which is equally important. And I, I love the fact that you're an artist, but you're a business person and you see it from both both sides. I think that's it's probably part of your, your formula for success is having that background and looking at it in a very methodical way. Well, yeah, I think, you know, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, definitely a hundred percent. Well, share with me a little bit, I guess let's talk about your family support for your career now. So mom and dad, they are, they must be over the moon and probably somewhat surprised by it. Oh Yeah. <laughs> They are, they are super proud and, and could not be more supportive. My, my parents come to a lot of my shows. Whenever I play at home in Vegas, they're usually there. Um, my dad was kind of bummed. He really wanted to come to Tokyo this time. Um, next time I'm definitely going to take my dad to Asia. It's mm-hmm. super fun for him. And, and my mom has kind of like, well, my dad's been out of town. My mom's been bored. She'll be like, can I come to the show this weekend? And I'm like, and I'll put her on a plane. And, you know, we went to Lincoln, Nebraska, and did a life in color together. Um, so you know, it, it's great to have such support, such a supportive family, and and it's great that they love the music and they, they give me honest feedback about everything that I do. It's really funny because my mom will will really not like some stuff, and then she'll really like other stuff. So it, That's it's great awesome. To have, uh, a parental perspective on everything that I do. Yeah, you want to be able to reach all audiences, right? <laughs> Yeah, no, exactly. And, uh, and uh, you know, even, even I think a lot of, you know, older generations would love dance music. They might just be resistant to it because it doesn't, like, necessarily have real instruments. That's usually the argument that I hear from older people. When I say older, I mean not actually older, just in their 40s and 50s. People are like, well, I don't really get this because it doesn't have instruments. And then when they actually sit and listen to it, they end up loving it. And I think you know, my parents are that, are that perfect example where at first they didn't really get it. And the more my dad has listened to it, he's developed his own his own taste within dance music, a very specific so kind awesome. of taste, which is really cool. <laughs> That's so awesome. So on that note, can you talk, maybe can you describe your fans to us? Describe my fans? You know, it's really interesting. I have, because I've changed my style, um, you know, ever so slightly every year, I have fans from all over the spectrum. You know, I've done, I started by doing pop mashups. And so... I have, you know, a bunch of my fans are, you know, 22 to 24 year old kids that listen to that stuff in college. And mm-hmm. so for them, my music is a little bit more nostalgic of their college days. Mm-hmm. But I have, you know, fans that like me for my biggest song, How You Love Me, um, definitely by far the biggest thing I've ever released. And, and that song is kind of an emotionally epic progressive house song. So yes, I've perfect. got those kind of fans. Then the next, the next song I'm releasing is actually, it's, it's kind of hip hop influenced but it's pretty much pop music. And so that'll be really interesting because I think that'll introduce my music to a whole new, a whole new fan base. And so my fans are all over the spectrum. Um, obviously, everybody, everybody who's a fan loves dance music, but, but everybody kind of respects and appreciates my style for, for the different genres that I, that I release. Mm-hmm. And I think what's even, what's even cooler is you know, what, most, what most of my fans know me for is my podcast, the Blau House podcast. It's, it's my 30 minute radio show that I release once a month in that radio show. You know, I don't stick to one genre. I literally play any kind of music within a 30 minute, you know, and I, I change songs really, really quickly within a 30 minute time period. And so that's because awesome. I do that. I, I feel like I've captured, I've captured fans from a variety of different places. Cause they actually get to hear what you do. I mean, they, they literally can hear you on the spot creating music. That's awesome. Exactly. Yeah. That, that, I can see why that's so popular. I'm going to have to make sure to tune in on that show. Maybe you could share with, uh, well, why not? No, why don't you tell us um, where they can hear that, hear your show, your podcast. Show. Yeah, um, all, all, the, all my music and my, and my podcast is available at just blah.com, blah, blah 3, 3lau.com, and pretty much all my info is on there. So. Oh, awesome. Well, tell us, so your favorite track that you've, you've created, which one would, would you say your absolute favorite? I think my favorite that's been released is definitely How You Love Me, um, which which was definitely which was my biggest, and mm-hmm. I think I, you know there's a special place in my heart for that song. I wrote it on the piano and then transformed it into dance music. A lot of people actually prefer the piano version, which is which is really Aww. fun for me because it was you know that was the original, you know the first the first form of of the song. I think 
in the future, I have a song on my mind that I'm extremely excited about. It's, it's totally different than anything I've done before. And I actually wrote it while I was in Australia this past February. Hopefully, it will come out next February in 2016. So, wow. Wow. Very we'll, look, that. we'll look forward to that for sure. Well, okay. Wish list. Who would you love to collaborate with? Ooh, I think, you know, most of my biggest collaborative dreams exist with singers, with vocalists, mm-hmm. more than other producers. Mm-hmm. Um, I've always thought working with Ellie Goulding would be super fun and amazing. Oh, yeah. um, I definitely think working with Calvin, Calvin Harris would be a dream. He's, mm-hmm. You know, I have so much respect for him and everything that he does. And I've been listening to him for a long time now, even before all the pop stuff. So I've just, I've gotten to watch his trajectory and it's been super inspiring. Um, and then other vocalist wise, I think I'm really into Halsey recently. Like her style is really unique and different. Mm. Uh, that's kind of what I've been I've been listening to, at least in the, in the vocalist world, is like figuring out who's who just sounds different because right. everything's kind of been done before. Um, and it's it's really interesting because that's the kind of st- the stuff that's working is the stuff that sounds different. Right, for the first time I think in a long time in, in the history of music. So very very cool. I, I was just in New York last week with a really good friend of mine. Um, Chitty Bing, and he let me hear some of the stuff that's not out yet. So that is something. When when you describe it, I'm thinking I need to let you listen to his stuff. <laughs> so very very yeah. cool. Well, awesome. awesome. Well, what's next for you? How and what's next on the horizon for you? So I have this song called Runaway, the, the, the poppy hip hop one that's coming out on October 16th. I'm about to head to Asia for my first Asia tour, which is super, super exciting. (laughs) And then I'm working for the rest of this year. I'm working on a new style, a little bit darker, a little bit deeper of dance music um, that I'll get to show all my fans in the beginning of next year. So that's kind of what's coming up. Awesome. And how can we all stay in contact with you and follow you? I know you you described probably your website, right? Yeah, blah.com, 3LAE.com is the best place to find all, all the information on me. I'm pretty active on Twitter. Um, which is my handle is also just at 3LAU on Instagram. Also, my handle is just at 3LAU. And and I'm pretty active on all social media. I try to communicate with my fans as much as possible. And you handle it yourself, then, I'm guessing. I do. Very cool. I love it. Well, it was complete pleasure meeting you and speaking with you. We'll have to get together soon. But thank you so much for your time. And I hope you have and a thank wonderful you for flight. Having me. Oh, yeah, for sure. Well, with that, thank you also, all of you who are tuning in to listen to this show. We'll definitely uh, find a time to get together so we can do some fun video. But if I don't talk to you soon, safe travels to you. And those of you who are listening, thank you for tuning in to the Renegade Million Show. This is Winnie Sun, and you can follow me. I'm very active on Twitter, and that's at Sun Group WP. And until next time.